So this week we will look at some general powerful techniques for solving problems that can be applied to a large variety of questions that we need to answer. So the first of these is called linear programming. So a number of the questions that we have asked in our algorithms course have involved optimization. So remember when we started with graphs, with weighted graphs, we were looking for shortest paths. Then later on we were looking for spanning trees with a minimum cost. Then when we were doing dynamic programming, we looked at subsequences that were common to two words and we wanted the longest such common subsequence. So in each case we are looking for some optimal value, either the shortest, the smallest or the largest or the longest. And of course, these values have to be found within some constraints. For instance, the shortest path between two nodes in a weighted graph must of course follow the edges that are given to us. So we are given some edges and among those edges we have to construct the shortest path. In the same way when we want to build a minimum cost spanning tree, the spanning tree edges must come from the edges that we already have. We can't construct new edges to make a spanning tree. And of course when we find the longest common subsequence, we are looking for letters which occur in the same order in both the words that are given to us. So we can't shuffle the order. So linear programming is a general class of problems which follow a similar paradigm where we are trying to optimize some value subject to some constraints. The reason that this is called linear is because these constraints are given to us numerically in terms of linear functions. So you know that a linear function is something where you have a variable multiplied by a constant but you don't have variables multiplied by each other. So you can't write x square or x times y but you can write x, y and so on. So supposing we have input variables x1 to xm, then a linear constraint would be of this form. It will say some linear combination. So we have coefficients ai and the variables xi. So some combination ai xi of our variables added up together is either below some value or above some value. So the constraint could be a maximum constraint. It can be that it can be no more than something or it can be no less than something. And finally, subject to these constraints, we have to optimize. So the optimization is given in terms of some quantity of these variables. So this is typically written as an objective, which is another linear function, right? Now notice that some of these co coefficients could be zero. So it could be that xj does not contribute to the, uh, to the overall optimum at all, in which case in this cost function or this objective function, cj might just be zero. But this is the general form. We have these linear constraints and then we have a linear function which tells us what we are trying to optimize, maximize or minimize. And now we have to find the optimum values for these x1 to xm subject to these constraints which optimizes that objective. So let's look at an example. So Grandiose Sweets is a sweet shop that sells two types of sweets, cashew burfis and dry fruit halwa. So there is a profit associated with selling each of these. For each box of burfis, the shop makes rupees 100. For each box of halwa, the shop earns rupees 600. Now the daily demand is known. They know that there are no more than 200 boxes of burfis will be sold in any given day and no more than 300 boxes of halwa will be given sold in any given day. Beyond that, there is also a constraint about how many boxes they can produce. So the staff of the shop working to, throughout the day can produce at most 400 boxes. These boxes can be either burfi or halwa. So now we are given these facts and our goal is to find out how many burfi boxes and how many halwa boxes grandiose sweets should market every day so that it maximizes profit. So to use linear programming, we have to set up those linear constraints and the linear objective as we said. So first we need to identify what the variables are. So here it's very clear that the variables are how many burfis we produce and how many halvas we produce or how many boxes of burfi and how many boxes of halva. So we use two variables in this case, let's call them B and H. So B is the number of boxes of burfis we would like to produce and H is the number of boxes of halva, sorry this should be halva, that we want to produce each day. So what we know from these constraints here is that if we produce B boxes of burfi and H boxes of halwa, then the profit will be 100 for each of the B boxes 
and 600 for each of the halwa boxes. So, we will cut 100 B plus 600 H. But we have some constraints. So, the constraint says that there is no point in producing more than 200 burfi boxes because they will not sell. Right? So, 200 is an upper limit on how many burfi boxes we should buy because the daily demand is at most 200. Similarly, the daily demand for halwa is at most 300. So, there is no point in making more than 300 boxes. Remember, B and H are the quantities we are going to make in one day. Then we also have this production constraint. Right? Production constraint says that the staff as a whole cannot make more than 400 boxes. So, the total amount of burfi plus halwa put together cannot be more than 400. And finally, there is a kind of implicit obvious constraint which we do not need to state which is that we cannot make negative boxes of burfis and negative boxes of halwas. So, at least we make, can make 0 boxes of one of them. Right? So, B must be bigger than or equal to 0 and H must be bigger than or equal to 0. Right? So, here we have the constraints. So, these are our constraints. Right? So, we have an upper bound on each of the boxes quantities and we have this kind of cumulative bound which tells us that together we cannot make more than 400 of each. So, this gives us one part of our thing. Now, we have to write our objective. So, our objective is clearly to maximize our profit and we saw that the profit is given because of, of this uh, thing that 100, box, 100 rupees per box of burfi and 600 per box of halwa. Right? So, we can get 100 B plus 600 H as our profit that we want to maximize subject to these constraints. Right? So, this is now the linear program that we want to solve. Right? We are given an objective which is a linear function of our variables. We are given constraints which are linear functions of our variables. Now, find the optimum values of B and H given this. So, one way to think about this is to understand what combinations of B and H are actually allowed. So, we can draw in this particular case because we have only two variables. We can draw this quite easily as a two dimensional picture, a kind of a graph. So, here on the x axis, I am looking at the number of burfis that I am going to get and on the y axis, I am plotting the number of halwa boxes that the shop will make. So, the first constraint, right, this constraint tells us that B must be less than or equal to 200. So, there is a line there indicating a boundary saying that I could not, I should not go into this region at all because this region is useless because the demand for burfi boxes is not more than 200 in a day. And similarly, there is a constraint on the halwa boxes which says that the halwas should be no more than 300 because there is no more than that demand. Then we have this demand which says that the total production capacity is limited to 400. So, this becomes a line like this. So, where B plus H is equal to 400 that gives the boundary. So, everything that we produce must be below B plus H equal to 400. Right? We cannot cross 400 because our staff cannot make that many boxes. Of course, we also have these two lines right, giving constraints saying that we must be above B equal to 0 and we must be to the right of uh, sorry, we must be to the right of B equal to 0 and above H equal to 0. So, with this we get what we can call a feasible region. So, any combination of B and H which lies in this yellow region is within all the constraints. Right? It is below this constraint, it is below this constraint, it is to the left of this constraint, it is above this constraint and to the right of this constraint. So, we have to search for B and H within this feasible region. So, if you go back to the way we have solved various problems, a brute force approach would be to actually search this entire space. Now, of course, one complication here is that this space is continuous, right? So, we could look at things like we could even find things like 100, 100.01, and so on. There are arbitrarily many different things. Of course, we cannot make fractional boxes, but still there is a large space to search. So, for example, if we take C to be our objective function, right, 100 B plus C H, 600 H and then we pick a point, say we pick this point. So, at this point what happens is that we are making 0 burfi boxes and we are making 100 halwa boxes. Since 100 halwa boxes gives us 600 each, the total profit that I get here is 600 into 100 is 60,000. Now, I can stay within the feasible region and increase my production of halwa boxes. So, I can go up for example to 200 halwa boxes. And if I go to 200 halwa boxes, then I will get 120,000 or 120,000 as my profit for the day. I can go still more right, and go to 250 halwa boxes and I will get 150,000. I can start making some burfi boxes. So, I can for instance make 300 halwa boxes and that leaves me a capacity of 100 because my total is 400. So, I can make 100 
burfi boxes in addition to those 300 halwa boxes remember there's no point making more than 300 halwa boxes because i'll go outside the feasible region so the maximum number of halwa boxes i can make is 300 and then i use my spare capacity to make 100 burfi boxes so i get 180000 from my halwa and i get 10000 from my 100 burfi boxes so i get 190000 right and in fact you can kind of work out even manually that this is going to be the optimum value for this particular problem okay so notice that this particular value lies at a corner of this feasible region right so it doesn't lie here it doesn't lie inside of course it has to lie within this yellow zone but it's lying on the boundary and more than the boundary it's lying at a corner so this is one interesting property about linear programs that you will find that the optimum value will always lie at a vertex so if i draw this particular feasible region then what it means is the optimum value must be at one of these five points it cannot be anywhere else so it must be at some vertex in the polygon sense not in the graph theoretic sense that we have been used to but if you think of polygons as shapes it is at some vertex of this of this feasible region that we draw by by inserting all our constraints as lines so there is a very classical algorithm which solves linear programs by exploiting this observation so what you do is you start at any vertex so you first have to calculate of course that feasible region and once you calculate that feasible region you know where the vertices are which are the, all the corners in some sense of that feasible region so you start at any one and then you evaluate the objective there right and then once you evaluate the objective there you look at all the next nearby vertices you look at all the neighboring vertices to the place where you started and if the objective improves by going to any one of them then you move if the objective doesn't move then you if the objective does not improve then you stop right so this is what is called simplex so you just start at a vertex and try to find a vertex whose objective value is larger than all of its neighbors right and you can actually show that this is correct now the problem with this algorithm is that it is not necessarily efficient right it can take an exponential amount of time but in most practical problems like the kind of question that we raised with burfi and halwa simplex actually works well so this is quite often used in practice as a solution for these linear programs there are theoretically clever ways to solve linear programs which are provably efficient so you can actually do this in polynomial time but so simplex is an easy thing to do and it's what most people use if they are not very worried about this extreme cases so we said that these solutions will exist at the feasible vertices right so for that of course the feasible region must exist so the first point is the feasible region is convex so convexity is a geometric property so intuitively something like this is not convex and something like this is convex so formally you can say that a shape is convex if i take any two points inside the shape right and i draw them a draw a line connecting them the entire line stays within the shape so this is not convex right whereas this is convex because i take any two points anywhere and i connect them so in terms of our polygons right so the usual thing holds so if a polygon is convex it will look like this if a polygon is not convex for example a typical thing will have a kind of inward facing corner right so the feasible region for a linear program is always going to be it turns out a convex polygon and of course the convex polygon may be empty right so there may be no constraint with no value which satisfies the constraint so for instance supposing we had said that you must produce at least 250 burfi boxes and you must produce at least 250 halwa boxes but you cannot produce more than 400 together right this will give me an infeasible set of constraints because the first two constraints imply that together i must make 500 but the third constraint our old production constraint says that i cannot make more than 400 so it's possible that the feasible region is actually empty that you don't have a polygon doesn't have any interior in which case you have no solution the other thing that may happen is that you have no upper bound in some direction right so for instance if i'm if i don't have an upper bound on my halwa right and i only have an upper bound on my burfi then i say that my burfi will keep me here but i can go as high as i want in terms of the halwa right 
So, then there may be no upper bound or upper limit on my objective function. So, let us look at a slightly more elaborate example. So, supposing this sweet shop adds a third sweet. So, in addition to their burfis and halvas, they have now added an almond rasmalai. So, we know that for burfis and halva, we used to get a profit of 100 and 600 per box. Now, rasmalai turns out to be an even more profitable item to make. The shop actually gets 1300 for each box of rasmalai. So, here the daily demand as before for burfis and halwa is known that is no more than 200 boxes of burfi and 300 boxes of halwa can be sold in a day, but there is un, unlimited demand for rasmalai. You can make as much rasmalai as you want and people will buy it. However, we still have this capacity constraint in our shop. So, the people who are boxing these sweets cannot box more than 400 in a day. So, this was true when there were only two types of sweets and the same constraint holds when there are three types of sweets. So, of course, you could now look at this and say if the rasmalai is unlimited and there is a much higher profit for rasmalai and I can make 400 boxes, then the obvious solution in this case is to just make 400 boxes of rasmalai. Now, it turns out that there is one more constraint which is going to come which will prevent us from doing that and that is that we need to use milk for both halwa and rasmalai and there is some limitation in how much milk we have. So, the milk that we have will allow us to make 600 boxes of halwa. Of course, we will not make 600 boxes because we know that 300 is up, our upper bound or it will allow us to make 200 boxes of rasmalai. But if I have made 200 boxes of rasmalai, I cannot make any more halwa because the halwa is already all the milk is used up. So, the remaining 200 should be burfi. So, maybe I should make a few less rasmalai and make a few more halwa. Right? So, the point of this 600 and 200 says that every box of rasmalai takes uses up three times as much milk as every box of halwa. Okay? So, this is our milk constraint. So, if we reduce a, a, a our halwa by say 100 boxes, then we can get well 100 is not good say 90 boxes, then for those 90 boxes I can make 30 boxes of rasmalai. Okay? So, the question again is what is the mix that we want? So, we have a new linear program because we have one extra variable which is the number of rasmalai boxes which I will call r. So, as before we have b and h. So, we want to maximize the profit that we make by selling B boxes of burfi, H boxes of halwa and R boxes of rasmalai, where the profit per box is 100, 600 and 1300. So, the constraints on the production of individual boxes are only for burfi and halwa because they have the ones where there is a daily demand limit, rasmalai is unlimited. So, there is no new constraint on the individual production of rasmalai. However, Together, we know that we cannot make more than 400 boxes. So, that overall constraint on production has not changed even though we have added one more type of sweet to the mix. And now, we have this new constraint which has come from here, right? the milk constraint. So, what this milk constraint says is that, so this is should be less than or equal to, it should says that H plus 3 R must be less than 600. So, we know that if R is 0, then h can be 600. If h is 0, then r can be 200 and any combination in between is allowed, but every time we remove 1 r, we can substitute 3 h's or we need to remove 3 h's to get 1 r because r takes 3 times as much milk as halwa. Right? So, if I reduce h by 3, I can add 1 to r and keep this equation because that 1 to r will get multiplied by 3. So, this is our overall constraint on the halwa rasmalai mix. And as before, we cannot make negative amounts of anything. So, B, H and R must all be bigger than 0. So, this is now this linear program and last time we drew a picture. So, let us see what the picture might look like. So, this time the picture will have three dimensions, right? Because in the earlier case, I had a two dimensional picture. One axis was burfi and one axis was halwa and now I have a three dimensional picture. So, I have one axis. So, this part is my old picture, right? And now I have added a new dimension which is our rasmalai. And so, if you look along this dimension, we have our old constraint. So, if I make no rasmalai, right? If I make no rasmalai, then I am on that plane which involves only burfi and halwa, and this is exactly the picture we had before. So, this was that line which says that B plus H 
less than 400 and this is the line which says that B is less than 200 and this is the line which says H is less than 300. So, in that plane where R is 0, so if this R is actually all the way slid, slid back to 0, then I get that plane there. But if I start moving in this direction, then something has to give, right. So, either the Rasmalai, either the halwa component comes down, right, or the burfi component comes down, right. So, this is becomes a three dimensional picture, but the old observation that our points where we are going to find the optimum are these vertices still remains. So, we only have these definitive vertices on this three dimensional shape, okay, it is convex, you can look at it and think it is con, there are no interior facing vertices, right. So, in this convex thing, we have to look for these vertices and we have to evaluate at each of them. And in this particular case, we claim that the optimum actually happens here. So, at this point, we are kind of on this plane, right. So, we are not making any burfi at all. We are making 400 boxes. So, we are achieving our production capacity and in that we are using 300 boxes of uh, halwa and 100 boxes of rasmalai. So, remember that I could make 600 boxes of halwa. So, bringing it down to 300, I am releasing 300 by 100 by 3 is equal to 100 units of rasmalai worth of milk. Right? So, that is why I am able to make 100 here. So, so it is not actually a good idea to make as much rasmalai as possible. It is actually better to make a little less rasmalai and make more halwa to make our production capacity. And with this, you can calculate if you work out the, the cost that you actually get 3 lakh 10,000 or 310,000 rupees. So, you might ask of other than you know, first if you believe what I said and you evaluate it at all these corners then you can check that this is the maximum. But is there any other way to satisfy ourselves that this particular value is optimal, right? So, is there any other validation of this fact? So, let us see if we can figure out why this particular combination of 0 burfi, 300 halwa and 100 rasmalai is optimal. Right? So, remember the profit was given to us we got 100 profit for each box of burfi, 300, 600 for halwa and 1300 for rasmalai. So, 100b plus 600h plus 1300 r is what we get for any combination of b, h and r. Now, we had a number of constraints, but let us focus on these three particular constraints. So, we had a constraint which said number of burfi boxes is less than or equal to 200. We will ignore that, but we will look at the number of halwa boxes, which is less than 300. Then we know that the total capacity constraint is less than 400. And we know that the combination because of the milk constraint, the combination of halwa plus rasmalai is bounded by H plus 3R less than 600. So, what we can do is we can remember that when you have two equations, you can combine them and you get a third one. So, this is how for instance you, you solve simultaneous equations, right. You create a new equation where then you can subtract one from the other and remove one variable. So, you can take two equations, you can take a combination of these two equations, add them and you will get a new equation which is valid. So, in this case, I am going to construct a new equation by multiplying the first one by 100, the second one by 100 and the third one by 400. So, notice what happens if I get the first one, if I multiply by 100, I get 100 h, second one gives me another 100 h, the third one gives me 6, 400 h. So, between the 3 I get 600 h, right. Now, if I multiply the first one, there is no other variable in the first one. So, if I multiply the second one by 100, I get 100 b, but there is no b in the third one. So, the 400 times c does not contribute to the b. So, the total b's that I get is 100 b and 400 times c, the first one does not have any r, second one has 400 r, right and the third one has uh, sorry, second one has 100 r because I am multiplying by 100 and the third one has 1200 r because 400 times 3. So, I get 1300 r, right. And on the right hand side, right, I will get 300 into 100 plus 400, 40, 400 into 100 plus 600 into 400. So, that is, right, and this will be 310000, right. So, if you work it out, this is what you get. You will get 100 B plus 600 H plus 1300 R is less than or equal to 3 lakh 10,000. 
So this is just by taking this particular combination of these three constraints. So if these constraints are valid, then this new constraint is also a valid constraint because it's just a linear combination of the existing constraints. But what is the left hand side of this? The left hand side of this is the profit. Right? So we have magically got a constraint on which the left hand side is the total profit that we can achieve for any combination of B, H and R. And it says that this combination of B, H and R can be no more than this, no matter what B, H and R are. Right? So the left hand side of this constraint is a profit. So if we can achieve this right hand side at any combination, then that must be an optimum. Now it's not saying this is the only optimum, there may be other optimum, but certainly this value that we have found or claimed to found, have found that 0, 300, 100 is actually an optimum value. So this was very clever. So how does it work? Right? So we derived this upper bound by taking a linear combination of constraints and how did we get this linear combination of constraints? We sort of guessed it. right? So it turns out that you don't need to guess it. So it turns out that this is always possible. It's always possible to find a linear combination of constraints, right? which gives you an upper bound. In this case, because I'm giving a maximization problem, it gives me an upper bound on the optimum. If it was a minimization problem, it will give me a lower bound on it. It says it cannot be lower than something. Here it's saying that the profit cannot be higher than something. So what we did was we took 100 times one equation plus 200, uh, 100 times another equation plus six, 400 uh, times another equation, right? So the thing was, what we had to guess was these values, right? So these multipliers or these coefficients. So implicitly, we also add zero times that thing which said B is less than 200, right? So this constraint had a multiplier of zero. So they have some constraints which we did not use where you can think the multiplier is zero and some which we did use. Now we will always multiply by some non-negative quantity, but we don't know what these quantities are. So you can think of these as now unknown. So I want some A1 times constraint 1 plus A2 times constraint 2 plus AK times constraint K. So if I have K constraint, so this becomes my combination. So I want to find some upper bound on this quantity, right? And it turns out that you can solve this problem and this problem is called the dual, right? And if you solve this problem and find those constraints, then those constraints will actually give us a solution to the other problem. So this is a very interesting aspect about linear programming. We will not get into it, but it's a very deep observation about linear programs that you can actually take the constraints of the original program and construct a new linear program, which involves combining those constraints and derive from that something which gives you an upper bound on the original solution. 